Constitutional Conversations is a series of discussions by America's leading scholars about the principles, framing, ratification, and implementation of constitutional government in the United States. This series is hosted by the James Madison Memorial Fellowship Foundation of Alexandria, Virginia. Slavery was, existed in every state in the Union at the time of the American Revolution. Uh, the northern states had quite a few fewer slaves than the southern states did, and so uh, the southern states would be less willing to emancipate their slaves, partly because of racism, partly because of the economic need that was there. Uh, there were also fewer Quakers in the southern states. Quakers were very uh, prevalent in several of the northern states, particularly in Pennsylvania and in um, Rhode Island. And they were staunch advocates for emancipation, for the elimination of the, of the slave trade and for uh, abolition of slavery uh, in, in general. And so in 1780, uh, Pennsylvania passes the first gradual emancipation law. The preamble was written by Thomas Paine, who was uh, the uh, clerk of the assembly. And this provided uh, that at a certain uh, point in time, it was a certain date, every child born to a slave mother would be free. The status of a child was always determined by the condition of the mother, not the father, and not the physical appearance of the child. Uh, the child could look to be white, could pass for white, but if the child was born to a slave mother, the child was a slave. And so Pennsylvania passes the first uh, gradual emancipation law. Other northern states follow suit. Um, you have to determine in these laws when will the child leave the mother. The child will stay with the mother uh, for a certain period of time until they're an adult. The compromise position in Pennsylvania was adulthood was 28. Now that was not true in any state in the Union. Everybody realized it was either 18 or 21, usually 18 for women, 21 for men. But the compromise to get that bill passed was 28, was adulthood in Pennsylvania. And so uh, each state passes these gradual emancipation laws. In Virginia, so many slaves were put into the army, uh, many of them serving as substitutes for the sons of wealthy planters. And it was realized that these blacks in the army were coming out of the army as slaves. And so they passed a uh, bill in 1782 making it easier for Virginians to free their slaves either when they were alive or in their wills. And so quite a, quite a bit of emancipation took place in Virginia at that time. And then uh, uh, finally, I would say, it was easier to emancipate slaves in the North because racism was less significant in the North. With smaller populations and slaves being uh, spread throughout the, the country, many one or two on a farm, there was not so much racism as there was in the South. Now, what happens is when you do get a sizable free population in the North, racism rears its ugly head in the North, just as well as in, in the South. And so there's racism both places, and the abolitionists who are heavy, heavily located in the North uh, alienate many people, not only in the South, but also in the North because of this racism racism that exists. And finally, I would say, uh, in, the, in the South, the great leaders don't stand up and serve as an example. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, they don't free their slaves. Lafayette uh, writes a letter to Washington in 1783 suggesting, let's buy a plantation in the west of Virginia and put freedmen there to show, first of all, that they can survive on their own, and second of all, that you endorse the abolition of slavery. Uh, that didn't happen. Washington said, let's talk about it when you come back to America in 1784. There's no record that they talked about it. Lafayette institutes his plan in Cayenne in the French West Indies, but that plan is not implemented in, in Virginia. And uh, as I say, the, the leadership in the South does not make a bold statement for abolition.
Constitutional Convention, obviously meeting in secret uh, at this time, uh, discussed slavery on several occasions. And in these discussions, the New England states always took the same position. This is a moral issue that we're not appointed to address. So we should not be looking at this issue. Obviously, it would be good to eliminate slavery and the slave trade, but that's not what we're about. And so let's not look at that. The middle states, uh, on the other hand, took a higher uh, moral tone. And you see a number of speeches, most uh, particularly by Governor Morris, in which they denounce slavery. And they say, we must do something about slavery. Interestingly, George Mason from Virginia gives a speech in which he denounces slavery, denounces the slave trade, but also denouncing slavery, and it tells what a dangerous thing slavery is uh, in the country. That is, it could be, this is not the words they use, a fifth column, uh, and, and a dangerous element in case there's a war. And they, they had seen what the British did, how the British used slaves. And so the more slaves in the country, the more dangerous that situation was. Danger from domestic slave insurrections, but also during wartime. And, and also, Mason saw how, uh, what, what a terrible impact slaves had on white children. It made them petty tyrants, and they grew up with that kind of mentality. And so Mason advocated uh, the elimination of slavery. He said, God cannot publish countries in the hereafter, only individuals. But God will punish countries here on earth. And so he predicted a grave punishment that the United States would suffer because of the slavery that it had. Now, the southern states, on the other hand, they wanted slavery protected, particularly, I should mention, the Deep South, uh, where they were hurt very much by uh, the British activities in, in the South when the British invaded South Carolina and Georgia. Many slaves were siphoned away and uh, the, those two states needed to replenish their slave supply. And so they were actively lobbying in the Constitutional Convention for uh, protection for the foreign slave trade and wanted to make sure that slaves would be counted in, in uh, apportioning representation. So the Deep South, in particular, advocated the slave provisions. The Middle States uh, uh, opposed slavery and all the protections in the, in the Constitution. The New England states didn't particularly want to raise the issue. And in the very end, you see that the New England states enter into a compromise with the Deep South. They both vote to extend the a prohibition of Congress from uh, stopping the foreign slave trade until 1808 in exchange for Southern votes that would have required a two-thirds vote for commercial acts, making only simple majority necessary to pass commercial acts in Congress. What the South feared was that the Northern states would dominate Congress and prohibit uh, the exportation of American goods in British ships, which would increase the demand for Northern ships to carry the Southern staples the Northerners would raise the freight rates. And so the Southerners wanted a veto power over commercial acts. If they had a two-thirds vote requirement, they could veto and they could, re, uh, they could uh, make sure that no detrimental commercial acts would be passed. They gave up that right uh, in exchange for a compromise that extended the prohibition for Congress uh, cutting off the foreign slave trade. So there was actually a compromise between New England and the southern states. Perhaps the single most important question that came up in the Constitutional Convention was uh, the question of representation. How would the states be represented in the new Congress? Under the Articles of Confederation, every state, no matter how big, no matter how small, got one vote in Congress. You could elect between two and seven delegates. You had to have two to be an official delegation. But Virginia proposed something different. 
Virginia was one of the largest states. There were three large states at this time, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. They all wanted more representation in the new Congress. They didn't want to be equal to tiny little Rhode Island, tiny little Delaware. And so they proposed proportional representation, either on the basis of population or wealth. Eventually, it, it narrowed down to on population. And so you're going to have proportional representation in at least one house. It was decided only one house would be proportional. The other would be equal state representation in the Senate. Once you decide on proportional representation, the next question is, what about the slaves? How do you handle the slaves? A similar question came up in 1777 when the Articles of Confederation was being drafted by Congress. And the issue there was not representation, but apportionment of taxation. How do you apportion the taxes among the, the states? And it was decided by population. How do you do that? How do you count slaves? And they couldn't agree. And so they decided instead of using population, they would use land valuation. And so that's what's in the Articles of Confederation. But as it turned out, it was impossible to get the states to submit appropriate land valuations. Whenever the states did uh, submit land valuations, they always lowballed their valuation so they would be assessed lower taxes. So in 1783, a, an amendment to the Articles of Confederation was proposed saying that taxes should now be apportioned by population. And again, the issue of slavery came up and they decided, it was James Madison who made the proposal, three-fifths. It was decided, it was recommended five-fifths, uh, two-fifths, 50%. Madison suggested 60%, three-fifths, and that was agreed upon. That amendment went out to the states. It was adopted by 11 states, not the 13 states that were required. But Congress had no other method to apportion taxes except population because they had no proper land valuations. So they used that even though it was not officially adopted. So three-fifths became known as the federal ratio. So in the Constitutional Convention, when they're discussing representation now, uh, they decide to, they have to decide the, the slavery issue. Now it's interesting to see back in 1783, when the issue is taxation, do you count slaves? The Northerners say slaves are people, they should be counted. Southerners who don't want their taxes raised say no, slaves are property, they should not be counted. Now the situation is reversed. In the Constitutional Convention, the Northern delegates say slaves should not be counted because they're property. The Southerners say, yes, slaves should be counted because they are people. And so it was again, they, they, they said, uh, let's go to the number we know, three-fifths, the federal ratio, and we'll use that. So that's how the three-fifths clause got into the, constitutional, into the Constitution. In the ratification debate, uh, uh, you get... Uh, disagreement over this. Uh, you get uh, the, the Northerners are upset that three-fifths of the slaves are being counted. They think that's unfair, that will encourage slavery, and that more slaves will be imported so that there will be greater representation of the southern states. The Southerners are, for the most part, happy with the three-fifths. They would have liked five-fifths. They would like slaves to be counted as, as full-fledged individuals, just as women and children are counted uh, in the population uh, for representation, even though they can't vote and they're not thought to be free political entities, uh, and yet they're still counted. And so the, the, the South uh, was satisfied with the three-fifths clause, although they would have liked more. And, and so uh, in, in the ratification debate, I, I would say that the Northern states, the Federalists, their argument was we had to compromise. We had to give the South something. And uh, every, on every issue, there's compromise. And this is no, uh, no different. And so that's how they justified the three-fifths clause. Many of the states had prohibited the African slave trade. In fact, it's uh, an interesting uh, observation that in 1763, with the end of the French and Indian War, it was much more likely that the foreign slave trade would be eliminated and perhaps even slavery abolished, much more likely 
than independence of the American colonies from Great Britain. Uh, there was a large demand for the elimination of the foreign slave trade. It was so abominable that it was pretty easy to uh, argue in favor of stopping that slave trade. To bring, uh, to bring free men, women, and children out of Africa and put them into slavery was just uh, reprehensible, and everybody realized it. Just about everybody. You do get the beginnings of the positive good of slavery coming out at the time of the uh, proposal of the Constitution. Uh, but uh, the Federalist position would be there are two states in particular, Georgia and South Carolina, who have indicated in the Constitutional Convention that their states would not ratify the Constitution if Congress could prohibit the foreign slave trade. Uh, so there was a the feeling we need those states to get the Constitution ratified. Federalists also used the argument that this was an improvement upon the Articles of Confederation, which had absolutely no power to regulate trade and no power to prohibit the African slave trade. Under the Constitution, after 1808, it was possible for Congress to prohibit the African slave trade, and it was expected that that would happen. Not guaranteed, but expected that would happen. In the northern states, there was also a, a Federalist argument that if you eliminate the African slave trade, which was, would be possible in 1808, that signaled the death of slavery, that that would be the beginning of the end of slavery in the South. And so this, uh, although it looked terrible on paper, that the Congress was uh, sanctioning the continued importation of slaves, there was a silver lining, so to speak, uh, behind this that perhaps this would be the end of slavery. The Fugitive Slave Clause was added toward the end of the Constitutional Convention and was taken from the Northwest Ordinance that had just been passed in Congress in New York City in July 1787. And in the Northwest Ordinance, Slavery was prohibited in the Northwest Territory, but there was a fugitive slave clause. Runaway slaves uh, should be returned, and government authorities and private individuals should assist in the return of these fugitive slaves. And so the, uh, the Constitutional Convention added that clause to the Constitution as a protection for Southerners. And one state where there was the most objection to that was in Massachusetts. Because in Massachusetts in 1781, a famous case occurred. It was a case of Quog Walker. He was a runaway slave, and he had established himself uh, as a, a freeman. And uh, his former owner, Matthew Jennison, found him and forced him back into slavery. Beat him up. Uh, uh, Walker would not go freely. And so uh, Jennison took him back by force. Walker's friends sued in court for battery, and it went through a series of trials ending up in the Massachusetts Supreme Court. In that, Chief Justice William Cushing, a slave owner himself, ruled that the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights, adopted in 1780, starts out, all men are created equal, which meant, in his judgment, Slavery was unconstitutional in Massachusetts. And so by the time of the first federal census, there are no slaves in Massachusetts. Massachusetts had become the asylum for runaway slaves. And so it was there that uh, uh, white folks and blacks as well objected to this fugitive slave clause because it meant Massachusetts could no longer serve as that asylum. Runaway slaves that got to Massachusetts would be forced to be returned to their owners. Probably the most important act in emancipating slaves was this gradual uh, uh, process that started in Pennsylvania where uh, states would provide for a gradual process. It was felt that immediate uh, emancipation would uh, be too disruptive. Now that occurred in Massachusetts where in the Quog Walker case, slavery was outlawed, but it did take about three years for that to be accomplished. But 
uh, the Quaker movement in the North, particularly in Pennsylvania and in Rhode Island, the Methodist movement in Virginia uh, tried to eliminate slavery. But it was this gradual process where uh, the status of the child uh, would uh, be determined by the mother, but any child born after a certain date would be declared to be free. And that child would stay with the mother until they became an adult, and the masters were supposed to be training that child to be uh, uh, full-fledged free individuals with occupations, reading and writing capability. So it was that gradual process that was important. It's interesting to note that New York passes a gradual emancipation bill in 1785. But that bill was a terrible bill because it provided that any person with any bit of uh, black blood in their veins, any kind of uh, ancestry that was uh, uh, African American, would be disenfranchised. They couldn't vote, they couldn't uh, uh, be elected to office. Whereas before this, before 1785, Freedmen could vote in New York. That wasn't true in every single state. Uh, the Council of Revision, which is sort of the grandfather of the presidential veto, it was made up of the governor and the chancellor, the chief equity judge, and the three justice, justices of the Supreme Court. They had a veto power, and they vetoed that bill. And it went back to the legislature. The one house overrode the veto by two-thirds vote. The other house did not. And so that bill did not pass because it would have created an apartheid system in New York. It's not until 1795 that New York passes a, an appropriate a gradual emancipation bill. So these gradual emancipation bills, I think, are the, the most important process that frees many, in, in many uh, uh, slaves at this time. Constitutional Conversations is made possible by a generous grant from the Fairley S. Dickinson, Jr. Foundation. Constitutional Conversations is made possible by the James Madison Education Fund. <laughs>